Good morning. I am clearly not back in New York. If you have not been updated, I am in London right now. I was speaking at the Coin Bureau Conference and I spent the past three days, two, two and a half days here. Quick trip. I might come back in like a week or so, but very early in the morning right now, I'm about to head off to Poland. Um, that's a weird thing for me to say. I did not really expect to be making this video, but when I realized I had London and then about two weeks before I have to be in Davos, Switzerland for the World Economic Forum, also weird as hell that I'm whatever. I was like, you know, I'm gonna visit the homeland. I'm flying into Warsaw today. I will have a hotel tour because I'm staying at a hotel that is beautiful and the suite I got intentionally is like just gorgeous. I'm gonna vlog all of it. This hotel room at Lon in London is adorable, but it's tiny, so I'm kind of ready to get out of here. It's like seven in the morning and uh, yeah, need to, need to get out of here. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's still way too hot. I have arrived, but my room isn't ready yet. So I think the things that I was planning on doing yesterday, like I need to go get a phone charger because my stupid ass left my phone charger in London. I have to go get that and my dad wants me to visit some specific places and take pictures for him. So I have that like list of everything. He's like, please go for me. I think I'm gonna do that before my room's ready. Um, even though it's only an hour ahead here, I feel very, very thrown off. I think maybe I just haven't had nearly enough sleep lately. So um, more caffeine and more coffee necessary until, until then. Okay, I just got in here. Uh, yeah, it's be Whoa, okay. I'm just gonna show basically what, wow, okay. This is the dining room and then this is the living room. This is the bedroom. Oh my God. This is the nicest hotel room I've ever been in. Oh my God. And look at this, Mr. Marin Altman. <laughs> so I'm about to go walk around, see the area around here and also go get a phone charger before my phone dies. So this is the about to go steal your girl and get an iPhone charger in the middle of war soffit. <laughs> to my massage, but I wanted to give a proper intro to this video and explain like more the reason why I wanted to do this trip now and everything about like coming here. So my grandmother was Polish and she was in Lublin, which is further south than Warsaw. I'm gonna be visiting that later but her entire family was killed in the Holocaust and she was the only survivor and no one else in my family has been back here since. And I didn't grow up like at all familiar with Poland. Um, my dad was highly Americanized. He was literally named after Mickey Mouse. Like that's the level of Americanization that my grandparents wanted. They wanted no ties to Judaism or like being a Jew. Like not that they didn't practice, but they didn't want what happened in Europe to happen in the US at all. So they completely Americanized. My dad and I are like hella American, Texan, whatever, like no real, I guess, ties to this culture. I don't even like pierogies or things like that. It's just not my kind of food. However, I always wanted to go back because my grandmother said that I looked a lot like her, her sister and my grandmother would never actually describe the way that her younger sister died. So I don't know the brutality of how she died when she was younger, but I do know that my grandmother's youngest sister was like, she saw her killed in front of her own eyes and wouldn't describe it. And so knowing that I looked like her, it wasn't necessarily haunting in any way, but I was always like, that's interesting. And I look very similar to my grandmother as well. Like if you look at anyone in my family, I look the most like her hands down. So it feels very full circle to be in a place like this when my family were literally poor butchers. Um, when I was doing research to get my Polish citizenship, I hired lawyers, I hired people to do the research, and they found that my family was a butcher in Lublin. And my grandfather was a butcher in the US when he died when my dad was 15, so I never met him. But it's funny that I was always karmically like, I have to be vegan. Like these, just growing up, I didn't realize that was my inclination, but I did end up becoming vegan. So um, it just feels very full circle to be in the nicest suite in all of Poland. This is one of the nicest rooms in the world. And they're like, Mr. Altman, like, are you alone? Like Mrs. Altman, like who? And I'm like, don't worry about it. Do not worry about it. So 
Um, I did pay partially for this with Marriott points, not totally. Or wait, did I? No, I didn't pay for this with Marriott points actually, but I'll get hella points on it, so worth it. And the irony is that my South Node line is through here in Astro Cartography, and the South Node often relates to the past and ancestors, or like letting go of something that came before you. So um, it's the exact opposite of the feeling I had on my North Node line in Bali, where I felt like there was so much to do, there was a lot of pressure on my shoulders. I'm just like really happy to be here, and I think this is my favorite hotel room I've ever been in. This is beautiful. I have no, no words, so... Better head off to my massage. Just finished with my massage and usually I freak out when there's oil put in my hair. I'm like, please avoid it. Whatever oil she put in is like a dry oil and she massaged my face with it, my hair, and my hair is so pretty and shiny and it's not gross oil. It's like, I just, it was such a good, it was the best massage of my life easily the best massage of my life. If you're ever randomly here in Warsaw, anyone go to the Hotel Bristol and go to the e-spa and get a massage from Eva, like Eva, E-V-A, wonderful. And she even told me, she's like, your left side is so much tighter than your right side. Please like watch out for that. And I'm like, yes, ma'am. So I ordered dinner and they brought the adorable little room service to my room. I'm eating it on my bed because I'm that weirdo who like prefers eating on my bed than any other place. Like eating at a table, I don't know, it feels too formal. So I ordered the vegan double decker, which is like two sandwiches. It has um, avocado, hummus, and a bunch of veggies in there. And it comes with some baked sweet potato fries. And I also got a side of steamed vegetables. They call them boiled vegetables. Maybe they are boiled and a sparkling water. So this is the, the event. Yeah, looks cute. Good morning. It is 11 a.m. already because I had a lot of trouble waking up this morning. I was super tired, so I let myself sleep in. I have about two hours before some calls. So I have some calls at 1 and 1.30. And then I'm going to go tour the Jewish Polish History Museum, I think. I think I'm going to walk over there. Then this evening I'm going to be filming so I can catch like the good light when it's like 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 p.m. I want to film around then. So for now I'm going to... Actually, I don't know if I'll shower before. Should I shower before or after? I don't know, we'll see. I think I should shower now, just like get it over with. It has been a lovely second and I guess last day here in Warsaw because I had to switch my train to a few hours earlier. I leave at like eight tomorrow because I need to make sure I'm in Krakow early enough to meet with the team of developers that I am likely moving forward with. So I'm going to sign off of this vlog here. Or no, I'm not signing off of the vlog. I mean, I'm gonna tie up my Warsaw part of the vlog here before I head out to Krakow. Okay, actually, actually we're not done here because this is kind of funny. Yes, this is me in my robe. As you can see on the menu, the dish name is vegan double decker. So literally the dish name is vegan double decker. So I was ordering room service and I was like, I want the vegan double decker. She's like vegan sandwich. And I was like the vegan double decker. So she's like, oh, double portion. And I was like, I guess so. I was like, yeah, the double decker. So they brought me, uh, like six vegan sandwiches total. This is actually like really funny. Uh, so this is what happened, lol, LOL. I am here in Krakow and the hotel room is so cute. I actually, at literally 10 minutes before I got here, I canceled the hotel I was at and got this one because this one was not a Marriott like hotel, but I found it and I was like, I gotta stay here. So this is a little tour. We have the entrance. We have the bed here, windows, mirror coffee coffee and rooms important there was no coffee at the hotel bristol or there was actually but like it wasn't it was not that much oh and then we have a little view kind of wanted a city view but this is obviously fine now i am off to go interview and work with the developers i'm potentially hiring so i have to like rush over northern up north i think afterward i'll walk around and like tour a little bit uh, in the areas i want to see uh because yeah i can already tell like from being here that krakow is definitely cuter than warsaw like very different it's much cuter <laughs> 
I am now back from visiting my developer team and they're so kind and lovely and we ran through the entire like workshop of our uh, like overview of what we're going to do, um, our intentions, the plan, what we're concerned, what we're strong about. Like it went so so well. I'm so sweaty and just like gross because I was like I don't want to say I was nervous at all but you know when like stakes are high and you're just sweaty I feel so gross because I've been walking around and it's warmer here than it was in Warsaw. Um, and then I walked around like the old town center which is what I wanted to visit while I'm here really um, and the funny thing is that the contrast between like the old buildings and then there's like McDonald's KFC even Sephora in there so I went to Sephora and I have spilled what I bought everywhere but I got let's just this this is what I got at Sephora a uh, sample charcoal sheet mask charcoal nose things Pat Von D tattoo liner because mine is running out and I forgot to bring my replacement Tarte Shape Tape Concealer because I need a backup. Uh, this is in 12 Neutral, my favorite. And a Clinique Cleanser Balm because the makeup wipes I have are shit. Um, and then I have like two, I have three perfume samples in there. I need to work. I can't film videos right now. I need to just like settle down. And I feel kind of stupid. I think I was sleep deprived, but the first hotel that I was gonna stay at here, the one that I had a reservation at, it's like these huge apartment hotels that are all brick insides with hot tubs in the middle. And you know what my bougie ass saw? I saw that it was a four star hotel and this one was a five star hotel. And even though this is obviously beautiful, this is not like an all brick place with a hot tub and shit. So I should have picked that one, but I have to come back here end of the month to see my developers again for like an in-person thing. So I think I'm gonna book it at the end of the month because I really like it here. And I only have one more day left. Um, I leave very early in two days to go to Lublin and tomorrow I'm touring Auschwitz. So it's kind of like a full house while I'm here. Um, so yeah, this is, oh my God, I hate spot focus on this camera. I need to turn it off. But for now, gonna work, going to do some skincare and stay in for tonight, like early bedtime. <laughs> Good morning. It is my second day in Krakow and my first full day here and I have about 45 minutes before I'm getting picked up for my Auschwitz tour so I am having some coffee and need to get ready a little bit. Might do a workout. In the meantime, this hotel is really lovely with some of the small things but I will say that the bed is very uncomfortable. Like it's very uncomfortable. It's just a strange mattress. It's just straight foam. It's not like a mattress and there's no gym so I don't actually recommend staying here. The coffee's good though. So I got back from Auschwitz a couple hours ago. I'm gonna run through my experience and we can add in the clips into me explaining it. I think that walking you through just the entirety of it will be the most useful because just like clips with music or whatever, I mean, you can't really do that like you would a hotel room vlog tour kind of thing. I think that me explaining the entire process will be helpful for those of you who want to visit one day or who were just curious. So I booked through some random website and it didn't register my pickup location, but it also said you couldn't change pickup location. So I wasted money on one ticket. And so I bought a private chauffeur tour. I thought it was 800 PLN, which is like 200 US dollars but it actually was 800 US dollars. So I ended up paying $800 for a private chauffeur and tour of Auschwitz, which like they told me they're like, no one's ever booked that before. And I was like, funny, makes sense. Um, so the guy picked me up in like a Mercedes here at my hotel at 10. Once we got there, he gave me a driving tour around Auschwitz first before we actually entered the premises. And the area is beautiful. Like the area is a green, natural, you know, hilly area of Poland. And there's a lot of houses in the area. And I asked him, why does anyone want to live here? And he said, a lot of these people, for one, have no other place to live. And two, in Poland, like it's kind of sentimental, like you keep the house through your family. I do want to note also that these houses are new developments in the 90s or onward. Like there was nothing left. You'll notice this in Poland, that most of the buildings, houses, everything are very new. It doesn't mean that they're like glamorous, but the buildings are almost all relatively new because it was after the communist era that things started to pick up and that would have been 90s into 2000s, 2010s. So once we get there, you go through security and they start the tour. You go through the, I'm gonna butcher this, the Arbeit macht frei which is the work makes you free sign that is over many of the concentration camps. And the first thing that I noticed upon entering is that it's, like I said, it's beautiful. There are trees lining the streets. The brick is very like well, I, like if you look at the buildings, 
if if you did not know that those were barracks, this could pass for a village in this area because they're well-made buildings that the Jews made. They're all like very well lined up. Everything is in its place. And I asked around that and my tour guide said it's because the Nazis, they put on a, a front where even though there was atrocity going on inside the buildings for anyone just simply walking by, it was to look spotless and Jews would be killed if they walked on the grass. The grass had to be perfect. So th there's kind of this like very strange overlay of a facade where the grass is perfect, the trees are all lined up down like even down the street and they used to play music every morning as well to march to like they used to get the jews who were musicians to play music as there was the counting and the roll call in the morning which you would stand up in line for roll call at 4 30 a.m until every single person was found like if someone was missing your entire barrack could be shot because that yeah that's how intense it was but it was this strangeness and I think the movie Schindler's List does a good job at characterizing this where things are spotless and like these soldiers and the people like the Nazis running it made this into a, a very orderly operation. I do want to say too that I talked with my guide about this. Schindler's List is a great movie and it brings in a lot of cool historical facts and it was the last film to ever be actually filmed at Auschwitz, but it also downplays some of Schindler's uh, foul play. Like he definitely raped some of the Jewish women. Um, he also in the beginning was not a hero. Like he turned into a hero he wasn't initially. So um, do want to note that just as a side note, but I love the movie and Liam Neeson's acting and it is incredible. So you walk in and my guy is basically explaining all the details about what he, each building was used for, the figures, some of the people behind it, because he knew that I came in with knowledge of my grandmother. So I was familiar with the basics and he could get into like, what was the intention? What is some of his, he is like a master's in history um, and is working on, I think a, another degree. Um, and he was just talking about more details around the combat side. We talk a lot about um, as well, how it was not like Hitler. Like he is not alone in doing this. I mean, it was, but it wasn't just him this doesn't happen with one person and it doesn't happen with a group of people. It happens with an incredible amount of shared interest. And for a lot of German companies, they got incredibly cheap labor. So it was kind of like turning a blind eye and getting cheap labor out of these people because you didn't have to pay them. All the money went directly to the SS running this. So yes, like there's no getting around the atrocities of leaders in this, but also there's a lot of complicit activity on the business side, similar to how like you can yell all you want about Putin being terrible, but killing him or assassinating him is not going to change the larger issues. Like, it's not just, I, I disagree with it being just Putin's war. Not that there's any groups that I know that are directly involved, but it doesn't make, it's never just one person. Like, there's group support, or at least high-level group support. So we talked a lot about that because, yeah, and, and he emphasized how the efficiency was their priority. It wasn't being gruesome. Like, it's not as if Hitler had, like, a hatred of Jews that stemmed from nowhere. It was several several things that propagandize together where like oh hyperinflation oh we lost a war and everything's inflated oh that was the jew sabotage so there was a narrative that was convenient and allowed for putting these people into labor camps for work to be a convenient even though horribly um time-consuming and intensive. It was like a convenient out for him to mobilize a nation against a group and then like extract the labor from the group. So th we talked a lot about that in, in him explaining it because it was just me on the tour. He didn't need to cater to a group. And we could speak more candidly, I guess you could say, because I am so familiar with what my grandmother went through that I don't, we don't need to like, I don't know, dwell on like, like the, uh, we can, we can just speak about it as if like, we know, we know what went on. So we can speak on the more, the oversight kind of things. And so he takes me into these buildings and the buildings in Auschwitz are either shut and you don't enter them or you can enter them and they are uh, museum artifacts. So like the hallways and walls and furniture and everything are like how they were. They just have signs where like, go this way. So it, it is, it is how it was, but museumified. And the first building we went into was a building that housed a lot of the artifacts. So there was a huge amount of uh, things like prosthetic limbs. Um, there was a huge amount of pots and pans that they stole from the Jews. There was a huge amount of shoes, especially because 
when the Jews came to the camps, they were told to put their name and their like address on their suitcases. Th they were never gonna get their suitcases back. They did that so that they would be calmer. Like the Nazis told them, put your name on this so you can get it. So the Jews would be like, okay, cool. Like they were told a lot of them that Auschwitz was going to be a haven for them, that they were being moved out of where they were and off to a better place. And a lot of them believed it. So some people even paid to go there first. Uh, I didn't know that, but that's what my guide was telling me. So instead of obviously giving the luggage back to these people, they took all the shoes and all the goods and all the valuables out of the suitcases and kept them for themselves or made things out of them. E including like once women got there, they shaved the women's heads and used the hair from the women to stuff pillows. So like I said, the priority was not like the Jews and the treatment of them were a byproduct for a larger goal, which brings in the efficiency and the systematization of it. And that was one of my main takeaways was that the people aspect of it was a commodity, like they were commodified in it. And that doesn't, ch that doesn't divert any of the atrocity. It just qualifies it. it, puts it into a specific mode of being where th th they were used as objects and a means to an end. And it's why if you could not work, you were immediately killed. And in in Auschwitz 1, because Auschwitz had 1, 2, and 3, Auschwitz 1 was the first camp, we saw the labor force barracks, which are the Jews that were leading, like they, they were people that worked with the SS, basically the prisoners who carried out the SS duties, like the labor force people. They obviously got much better barracks, like much better where the Auschwitz one barracks are unrealistic because you'll see that they're just like these wooden bunk beds and it's one person a bed and it doesn't look that intense. Uh, but you'll then you realize that these are for the people that were basically snitching backstabbing, uh, wrangling the fellow Jews. They got that treatment. We also walked by, not in because they won't let you in there. It's not open. We walked by, I believe it was like house or building 10 was Mangala's experiment medical center. And that's something that I guess was something that I investigated when I was growing up and familiar with my grandmother because the medical experimentation that was done is atrocious and a lot of that came from needing a reason to be promoted and thinking of outlandish things that could be done in order to seem like groundbreaking research. For example, Mangala was saying that he was going to find a way, he was, he was stitching twins together to find a way to force women to have twins so they could increase the population of Germans. So he was like, I'm doing all these studies on twins so I can figure out how to impregnate women with twins specifically. Or with Jewish women, uh, they did a lot of forced sterilizations where they would inject random things and like the guy who was doing it got promoted because of that. So the medical experimentation was a good way to like get yourself promoted. That, that was the, the guy, the guide and I were speaking about that, how the logic behind it was if I can do something so groundbreaking that isn't military, military, it's medical. And Bayer, B-A-Y-E-R, was part of this, which is, it took them a while to get their name back on track as a legitimate company. Obviously today it's completely different and like no issues, but they were wrapped up in this somehow. So next to that building was the shooting area where they would shoot Jews, and there's a bunch of like roses and candles there, and um, that area is a bit redone because that was demolished. A lot of the camp was destroyed as the Germans left. Almost every gas chamber was destroyed and there's a lot of ruins. We also saw the underground jail cells which are frightening and there's writing on some of them like on the inside there's hearts and there's some words that you can't really make out but that was um that was a really intense part as well was seeing underground like the first gas chambers which were just rooms and what they did was they put the prisoners who were going to be killed into the gas chambers with varying amounts of Zyklon B because they were seeing what the minimum amount was that they could kill someone with so they had these like individual cells that they would put the prisoner sentenced to death in and they would test out the levels of Zyklon B that they could 
use and those levels in the minimum amount was what they then used in the larger ones. Then we went into the first gas chamber, the first major like building, the first death chamber basically that was not experimental, like the first one in Auschwitz one. And it's not very big and there were ventilation issues. So the Germans had to make another one and they decided to make the entire camp of Birkenau as a result. And basically that death and inefficiency around death was why they made Birkenau because in Auschwitz, you would have to carry the bodies up and out and into whatever, I don't know, the crematoria, and it was it was a lot of work. Instead, in Birkenau, they literally made it around one track, of, like train tracks, where at the end were the crematoriums, and you could just easily have that efficiency, basically. So then we did head over to Birkenau for the second part of the tour, and this part of the tour was, in a strange way, a bit more more sobering because Auschwitz is obviously awful when you see the buildings and the, again, the efficiency and the strategy behind it is what's like jarring. It's also well kept and has plants and you could see in, from what I recall in, in Schindler's List in films, it looks like that. It looks, I, I even feel weird using the word beautiful because they're, the, the plants are positioned very well is the way I would say it. It's not like you look at that and you're like, how pretty, but there's an order to it. Whereas Birkenau is very sober because it's a huge plot of land. If you look at this from above, it is huge and it's just one gate, one track of trains down to the very end and very spread out barracks on either side. It is like sobering. It, it looks like a prison. It does not look like Auschwitz. Auschwitz, if you didn't know what it was, it could pass for. This just looks like some kind of weird living area with bricks everywhere, like brick buildings. And I think it's important to say that because uh, it doesn't look like flat out. It doesn't look overtly like that w would be what it, it, it's being housed as because the gas chambers were underground. And just the fact that they built all this is like... And they did take floor plans and layouts from slaughterhouses for animals, and that's how they came up with the first prototypes of this. Um, there's also a Soviet memorial at the end of the train tracks, and it's kind of, it's hideous. It's hideous. Even my tour guide is like, no one knows what it really is, uh, but that's the memorials in communism. You're just like, okay. Um, Birkenau was... I'd say a bit more shuddering because of the size. And also there was a destroyed gas chamber that is at the very end because like I said, the Germans destroyed nearly everything. And you get to see again, the efficiency of like, they walk in, the crematorium is right there. Yeah, it, it, it's jarring. And the most impactful part was the very end for me, which is when we got to go into a woman's barrack. And this barrack was built on clay, which is why it keeps having to be redone with the floor. But the entire bunk bed area is still as it was. It has not been changed. So if you've seen Schindler's List and you know the scene where the Jew in Auschwitz, the, the young female Jew who is an engineer, she's like, you need to rebuild this. It is on clay. It's going to sink. She's killed for saying that. And the building is there that she talks about. And when you walk in, there's a lot of beds. It's, it's a cabin basically. And you'll notice that the beds could fit multiple people, but also that in the winter it would be very cold because they're just these wooden beds against brick. And there's a heater, but it only heats the center of the room. So the barrack that we went into for one was not survivable by most women because it was so cold in the winter. Like you would die with that low of body fat and starvation and everything. And also if you were there, it was because you were going to die. Like they didn't put useful people in this barrack and going in the sobriety and like how solemn it was. I didn't realize it until I left and I realized the kind of headspace I was in. And I just felt the need to like reach out and touch the wood and reach out and touch the wall. And there was a lot of writing all over the walls, but the writing was from tour like guests, from visitors that are mostly teenagers that don't really know any better. And even though the beds were supposed to fit like three basically in one bunk, I mean, when that cabin was found or when that barrack was found, they had about a dozen dead bodies on every level, which totals over 700 women in this one cabin, which is insane when you think about just how small these cabins are in comparison. So that was my experience, basically. Um, I had a really kind tour guide and really kind driver there and everything. And I wouldn't call it 
overtly emotional. No one, like, no one around me was crying. No one around me was doing anything. Um, you were just there listening and being there. But, oh my god, the fact that I'm alive today and that, like, my grandmother wasn't at Auschwitz, but she was at Majdanek, Dachau, um, Treblinka, Bergen-Belsen. She was mostly at Dachau, at, or Dachau, I don't know how to say it, uh, Dachau and Majdanek, but also Treblinka. And she ended up at Bergen-Belsen. But thinking that, like, I made it, like, that's insane. And it puts your problems into perspective. And it puts even shit like me being called an anti-Semitic neo-Nazi into perspective. Like, that's a small problem for people to fucking say that um, versus the actuality of the people that did go through that. And it's also very strange to know that throughout history, like, my people aren't treated like people. It's the kind of thing that I don't really have words for, but it's very small and like so grateful because my grandma was a badass like she had this big hair big jewelry big makeup and to know that she came out of that yeah I I mostly have a loss for words because it was so serious it feels like the words that I have to say although useful don't fully qualify how insane it is that I'm alive today and how like it reminds me in a good way, to shut the fuck up about these small problems, like, feel them, get over them, and do something in the world, because you're fucking fam- like, they did this, and you're here, you cannot fucking waste this, and I've dealt with suicidal ideation a lot, um, and this kind of reminds me to, like, fucking get it together, girl, like, these people were fighting, and it reminds me of when I would be young, uh, and I'd finish eating, and my grandma was like, you look like you're straight out of the camp, eat something, and it was just, like, funny, um, which is also why I think, like, I get humor, because I grew up with my grandmother being like, you're too skinny, you were like me in the camp, and I'd be like, okay, grandma, um, it puts it into perspective, is how I'd say, that was my takeaway, is, like, I'm safe in a hotel room in Krakow right now, miles away from where a lot of my family, or, like, every, everyone in my family on that side, literally everyone, was murdered. Not at Auschwitz. None of them were killed at Auschwitz. I looked at the records and they were all killed in Majdanek. Besides my grandmother who escaped Majdanek. That's literally, she just like dug a hole and escaped and then passed for German. Fucking badass. So that's my explanation of Auschwitz. I hope that it did it justice. Not justice, or not not complete wholeness. You can look at vlogs for that. People have vlogged the entire thing. Um, I took clips mainly because I didn't want to take away from my own experience, and I knew that I would do that if I was thinking about filming too much, so I took clips, but not, like, everything. So I hope that this helped explain that. Again, I don't really have words, but I'm very happy to be here. I am on the train to Rome right now, and when I tell you I've had a Mercury retrograde shit show, I mean going to the wrong platform like four times because the numbers were literally confusing. It kept giving me like platform then row and I, I don't understand Polish so I didn't know the difference between like platform, section, row. I just went literally up like 10 flights of stairs with this luggage because, and it's heavy as hell with no help because I couldn't figure out where to go. Yeah, so we should be there in like 10 minutes. I have so many interviews this weekend because of my recent market calls. Like I have so many people that want to talk to me. So, um, not only are my lips chopped, but I'm very tired and I need to shower like hell because carrying all this up was my workout today. Mercury retrograde process of getting here was hell again. Can't even explain how hard it was to get a taxi and then understand where I was going, but I have arrived. So let's look, let me show you around. It's actually pretty cute. So walk in, there's like a dresser, seating area, wine, which I won't have obviously. And then this is really cute. It is a double bed there and bathroom over here. There's no bathtub in this one, but in some of the rooms they have really beautiful bathtubs here. So this is basically the area and then out here is the city essentially. I have a little view of the city. It is nearly 7 p.m. now. I have filmed almost all of my July forecasts. I went on Rancho for like 15, no, it was like three minutes. It was a really quick segment. Filmed a lot of that, and then before my camera dies, I'm going to head out and walk around the old town and take some videos and just show you around like Lublin. And is it Lublin? Is it Lublin? I don't know. How the fuck do I say it? I don't know. But I um I had a cuter outfit on. I had like this with the skirt, but the skirt shows my entire ass and shit, so I'm not gonna wear that out here. I don't wanna be totally conspicuous, even though this is pretty conspicuous, but I feel like this is a shirt that you would see, like, non-annoying girls in. Like, this is not just a, a thing for cringe girls. Like, this is, like, a 
decent top. Like, this is cute. Okay, so we can do this. We can go out in public with this. Literally, no one here speaks English, so I'm gonna have a fucking time if I want anything out there, but it's it's fine. I'll get it all on camera. Hopefully, my camera does not die during this. That would be so sad, but just gonna walk around the area. This town's pretty small, so there's not really a point in, like, I don't know, tomorrow is gonna be my bigger day to go out and do things. But, um, yeah, I got ready, filmed, did some TikToks, and now I'm gonna go out, I guess. I just got back from walking around Luplin and my camera's about to die, but that was so cute. It reminds me of like what I would imagine Italy as. It was similar to Spain in some ways where it's just cobblestones and buildings and it's so clean and so cute and still has that old timey feel of like hills kind of where everything's built. It's up and down hills, but also modern with the signs and it felt cute. I was like, I wonder if my grandma's walked down these same streets and everything and like she would have had to even if she was out in the village somewhere. So um, I need to charge my phone so I can film the rest or my camera so I can film the rest of my July forecast. And I think tomorrow I'm gonna set up like self timer in some of the alleyways so I can get a picture because I don't wanna leave it without any pictures, but I don't know fucking how to, I'll manage it somehow. So I am really sad to have to jump in and explain this, but I went to Poland about two weeks ago. It's two weeks later. I'm now in Athens, Greece. I did not expect to be here right now upon being in my Poland vlog. Um, but I got the footage back from my editor and for some reason I lost, deleted before I finished uploading them to our shared files. I somehow don't have the footage of my visit to Majdanek. And Majdanek is a concentration camp outside Lublin, Poland, which is the one that my grandmother escaped from. It was the main one that she was at. And even though Auschwitz was more visually a better experience, it is a much bigger, much frankly nicer camp in a way. It's kept up much more uh, like a museum. The Majdanek camp was the actual one that I had a connection to. None of my family was in Auschwitz, I double checked. They were all killed in Majdanek except for my grandmother who escaped right before the largest massacre in all of the Holocaust of 18,000 people in Majdanek. So I visited it and somehow all the camera footage is gone. However, I do have iPhone videos because anytime I record on my camera, I also have my phone for Instagram stories and also as a bit of a backup. So thank God I have all the same videos, just portrait that I can include while I explain basically what I went through in Majdanek. Very similar to Auschwitz but instead it is slightly smaller and it's again less nice I would say the buildings are not uh, reconstructed in the same way because it was the most well standing camp it was not able to be destroyed like many of the other concentration or death camps and this camp is a museum and I was just walking through by myself it's not like Auschwitz where most people are on a group tour you can do group tours but it's not as common because you're going in and there's more of a guided kind of fence uh, uh, situation all around. So upon getting there, uh, you notice like a huge monument and it's again a Soviet war monument. And these are really weird. I mean, frankly, in my opinion, you can see how uh, living in kind of secluded communism, the, the art just turns out very strange. Uh, so it's this large scale monument where there was once a building there. I forgot what building was there. I believe it was the entrance, but there's now a large scale Soviet monument upon entering the large fenced area that is the Majdanek Museum. And as you walk along the path from that, there's a white house and that was the SS quarters. Notably, the house is not super nice or anything, but Majdanek again was not as nice and developed as Auschwitz. It was a work camp. It was not a final labor into death camp. You know, Majdanek did have gas chambers, but it was, it was more labor focused, which Auschwitz was like you were sent there and you died most likely. The next two buildings that are next to one another further up the path are the showers. There's the men's and the women's showers and they're actual showers. However, in the back, there's an identical shower that is actually the gas chambers. So everyone, man or woman, entered these facilities. And the absurdity and the cruelty was that the same building sector looks identical to the other versus the actual shower or the gas chambers. And this was where things got really sober for me, knowing that everyone in my family, my grandmother or the people who didn't survive. I don't actually know if my grandfather was at Majdanek because both my grandmother and my grandfather were in Lublin. Sorry to divert a second. Both of them were from Lublin, but they did not meet until later on in the war to discover that. So both of them were from Lublin, but neither knew that at the time when they met, they discovered that later. That was the very sobering part, was standing in that room and knowing that 
some of my family must have survived that and some of my family must have died in one or other of the room, man or woman. And that was very sobering. Um, I'm glad I was there alone in a way because that was just a very present moment. And after that, several of the other buildings that had been cleared out or were once barracks were used as museum spaces because the wood and the concrete had been preserved and reconstructed and added on to. And now there was uh, some exhibits around the history of the war, the Maidonic Museum, what it was used for, and uh, the, the, the history, the timeline behind it. There was also a uh, beautiful exhibit. There was an installation in one of them with flickering light bulbs and also a book uh, that had commemorated all of the Jews or other peoples killed there. there. And the book was open to the Ukraine page, but you know, there was Poland, there was um, Hungary, all the different groups of the, the people that had been brought into Majdanek to be killed, the, the pages commemorated that. There was another very large memorial that was a mausoleum that was where the crematorium once was, that it's huge. And then walking back on the other side, I visited the barracks. And these barracks, I unfortunately could not find videos of on my phone if I uploaded to my editor. I'll upload them now. The barracks were very similar to the ones at Auschwitz. Um, they were wooden, but I mean, essentially same thing. Very crowded conditions. Clearly, they would have been unsanitary with the level of cramped that they were. And on my way to do that, I actually walked in the grass. And I wanted to do this, and I sent this video to my dad because... Jews were killed, or any prisoner, they were killed if they walked on the grass. They wanted to keep these facilities, the Nazis, I mean, wanted to keep these facilities pristine. And it was um, important for me to walk on the grass a little bit there to be like, you know, my grandmother would have been shot by one of the snipers in the guard towers or whatever, you know, they would have been called there for doing this. And here I am today, walking on the fucking grass. Like, that was a really sobering, very powerful experience for me was walking up to the Eagle Memorial on the grass, knowing that my grandmother had likely walked on the path that was around this grass and that she could have never walked here. And that was so empowering. And so just, like I said, sober, very present for me. And I'm so glad that I did that. And after that, there was an ending museum and also gift shop area to finalize the tour. And this is the vlog footage that I'm saddest to have not had because I was filming just kind of, you know, camera open around the, the, the museum and the gift shop area of some mementos and some artifacts such as clothing or pictures and the resources like um, luggage that were, you know, similar to Auschwitz with the knickknacks and the things that the, the Nazis took from the Jews and the other prisoners. Some of those were in the museum and the gift area um, with some things that you could buy at the end of my Donic, my Donic exhibit. And the most surreal thing happened to me, like in this whole experience, this was the most powerful thing that happened to me because as I'm leaving the museum, uh, the, by museum, I mean the entire, you know, uh, Majdanek concentration camp area. It's called the Majdanek Museum. As I'm leaving it and I'm in the gift shop area, a girl comes up to me and she recognized me and asked what I was doing there. And I explained to her my grandmother's situation. And that was the most surreal full circle moment I had ever, like, that, that was the most intense moment because I get recognized often wherever I go. I mean, two to three million followers total if you line up all platforms basically and like everything that I'm noticed on. Um, and then much, much more views, like tens to dozens of millions a month on people that don't follow me and just hear about me. Th that adds up, but I mean, I'm not expecting to get recognized in a concentration camp museum. And I called my dad right after and was like, dad, you know, I just visited my Donick and someone like the fact that my grandmother survived that my entire family was killed. And then I go back and visit and someone recognizes me in that gift shop. I was floored. Like I, no one at this, no one at these is crying. No one is emotional, but that was a point where I was at a loss for words. I, like even describing this now, I remember filming that and filming after and just being walking and saying, I have no words, I have no words, I have nothing to say, I have no words, but this just happened. And that was insane. Um, and that to end my experience was just the most full circle, oh my God, I'm alive type experience. And I left there and started doing things that I had never done that I realized 
I'm, I'm living, I need to do. Like randomly going to Berlin with my friend, partying in Bergheim, meeting these people, going to Athens, Greece now, and being in like rural Greece in a fucking vi villa and living it up, disrupting my fucking sleep schedule, like not doing my routine, sure working, but like meeting people and making connections. Like that really empowered me to be to realize you're the only living woman on this side of the family with your grandmother's genes. Fucking live. Like, screw the people making shit up. Screw screw the fucking suicidal shit you're going through. Not that, not to discount it, but like, you are you fucking made it. Like, that, I, I hate that I'm saying like so much, but I have no words. So that was my Maidonic experience. And again, I'm really sad that that didn't, come through and I wasn't able to have that footage that is so insane that it's missing but maybe it is for the best because I'm now able to have the iPhone footage all good you can see the things you need to see and also explain how that led me to be now travel the world use up use up a lot of your savings if you want to visit all these things you can always make that back you can't make back sitting in your room working on things that you can work on, on planes around the world, screw choosing to go back and have your routine of your, your workouts and like eating and sleeping in this way. You can do that and make do like on your trips around the world, meeting cool people, doing cool things, live it up. I'm 23. I'm almost done with what would be the fun part of my life. I've discussed it before, but at 23, I feel like already I'm done being young and I'm not really valuable in like a youthful way anymore, which is so strange, but you know, fuck it. It's only me left to, to be able to live my my elderly life now. So that was my Maidonic experience and a culmination of my Poland experience. So I guess now back to the outro of the regular vlog before I realize I lost all this footage. I am heading out now to the airport. I am going, well, first flying to Warsaw, which is kind of weird. You don't need to fly there, but it routed me to fly through Warsaw from Lublin to Warsaw on like a 45 minute flight. Then I'm going to Berlin, um, which should be a nice change because I mean, it was cute to be here, but not my place. Like it's just not, like I said, it's on my self node line. Feels very tiring, lethargic. Um, I don't think the visiting Maidonic was particularly emotional. Like I said, when you're there, I wouldn't say that anyone I saw looked emotional or about to cry or anything. You're just very serious. You're touring, you're serious, you're not thinking to be emotional. I feel like it's a full circle moment that I'm very glad I did though. Like just coming back and walking on the grass. Like that was a big thing was me deciding to walk on the, the grass and then going on Bankless later and talking about my journey in crypto. And now I'm up like, 5x on Luna because I hope it gets to be a dollar and I'm like a millionaire off this trade. That would be really convenient. <laughs> but yeah, my thoughts and if someone wants me to explain like what I felt when I was there, I would say I don't really have any words. I just have space that I felt like I took up and I was very happy to fill while I was there, specifically because the tour was alone. Unless you're on like a school tour or in a big group, it's a solo tour at Maidonic. It's not like Auschwitz where there tends to be like you're in a group of people, even if you're alone. So it did feel like a full circle moment, but I'm getting out of here. I need to call them to help me with my luggage and then take it down the, cause this like hotel is on a little cobblestone walk only area. So you have to like get your luggage taken down to the street a couple minutes away. So it's gonna be an operation. But um, I'm very happy I took this trip. I hope that this gave some insight into the absurdity yet the importance of doing all this and we'll be more lighthearted in a few hours, hopefully, especially because someone, some Russian minister just said that the denazification is going to continue in Poland. I'm like, yeah, I'm getting the fuck out of here. I don't think I'll ever come back. Uh, no, it's just not my vibe. Uh, not that, again, it's, yeah, I'm glad I did it, but even my dad was like, yeah, I don't want to go. I was like, yeah, okay, I'll go for us. So, Hope this was informative. I look forward to seeing you on the next vlog. Take care.